Yeah. Hi, folks. Just want to uh, thank everyone for coming. Uh, I appreciate it was relatively short notice, but that's usually my go-to, and, uh, and I think for most of the lebs that are here, last minute's usually the way we get things done, so... Uh... I think you wouldn't be lying to say rugby league isn't the biggest sport in Lebanon, right? The real hub and core is here in Australia, and in particular in Sydney. That's what football's about. It's about emotion. It's about getting the community together. So I think I'll give you a bit of a rev up. The Lebanese rugby league team is ranked about 13th in the world. So for Michael Checker to take on a team like that in a code that is not the code he's experienced with, this means that it's something else. It's something very special to him, something that means more than just a game. Well, you know, we all believe in the one thing, that we believe in hope and dreams, and this place offering these young kids that opportunity. So, mate, I think with everybody on this boat, on behalf of us all, Michael, we all thank you very much. It's a passion project for me, obviously. I think I can do something for the community here to give young kids in the community something to look towards that they can achieve. The chance to coach you know, a country that he's obviously his parents are from, he's a proud Lebanese, so to have that opportunity to coach his country at a World Cup would be something he couldn't knock back. You'll make the right decision at the end, don't worry, but let's get off, work together and get up here to the cone. It is, in a sense, the classic Michael Checker role, the dream role for him. If anyone can get this team to um, play above their station, it is Michael Checker. I would describe Michael Checker as a complex personality, passion that runs deep, a real edge of anger, a polarising figure who could earn the respect and love of a rugby public in his finest moments, but also then draw the ire of those same people uh, in the way he responds to some of the tougher moments. No one could spit a dummy in a post-match press conference like Michael Checker. Have you played rugby, mate? Yes. OK, have you ever tackled anyone by the hair? No. You've tackled anyone? Exactly. you tackled someone by the hair. So forget about it. It's a non-issue. Mate, a lot of that stuff's done to show people you care. Uh, half the time, players just need to see that you want to... that you care. You're not just there for getting money. Michael's, uh, he's a fighter. And, you know, fans, they either love him or hate him. My personal view was always that, um, that being of Lebanese origin, uh, it, it, it shaped the way people may have viewed him and, and his temper, but we always saw it as his passion for the sport rather than because he was a fiery leb. Michael can be prickly, and that kind of temperament rubbed the wrong way with a lot of people who are in charge of the game. And he's not of the usual rugby union private school mould. And, you know, if you don't come from the usual system where most others inside that sport are coming from, you're an outsider. And people don't let you forget that. When I say, yes, I do feel like an outsider, that's my perception on things. I still felt I was an outsider when I was the coach of the national team. You couldn't get more on the inside. He has a soft spot, I guess, for the underdog. I think there's probably a bit of, from his own experience growing up, he, he always felt a bit of the underdog. And my dad came to Australia on Christmas Day in 1950. He was from the north of Lebanon, up in the mountains. Mum came here in 1958. Their families are from the same village in, in Lebanon. Mum was carrying a letter from Dad's mother that said, you know, the girl who brings you this letter is maybe a girl you should think about and having a chat to and whatnot. Anyway, one thing led to another and uh, they got married in 1960. Dad was a real Aussie leb, you know what I mean? He was really passionate about Lebanese people having the Australian experience. He gave us the gift of learning how to balance the two together and how to get the best out of both worlds. He totally embraced Australia. 
he enjoyed politics and, and he was very involved in the, in the community from a political standpoint. Uh, he was entrepreneurial, without a doubt. He was entertaining people from parliament, uh, dignitaries from around the world. I recall walking into their lounge room one day and Paul Keating is sitting there in their humble home, you know. So Michael, that was kind of second nature. He didn't really differentiate between whether he was down at the club or sitting in a boardroom. Maybe Michael should sit there. Nah, don't worry. Really just sit anywhere. Just sit anywhere. Sit anywhere, mate. And I'd like to think that one of my traits is that I can drink a champagne with the king or the queen and a, and a VB on the building site with the boys. You know, I'm not going to change who I am according to the circumstance. There's nothing weird about oh. Lebs talking about soccer, Daniel. Mm -hmm. I come to the very back end of my family, a third of three children, so I got the easy run. They told me specifically, do not... Don't. Don't play with the golf balls mm. near the house. You'll break the, You'll break the window. Michael, don't play with the ball <laughs> yeah. near the window. So of course, I hit the golf ball and it went straight through the window. Right. Yeah. But I used to have to pay him for the taxi to go for um, training. training. Well, I had to keep my energy <laughs> to, to train. <laughs> that, that's peak really performance, to Therese. So by the time I walked to the park, I'd be too tired. He loved sports, loved any kind of sport. And the one thing I just remember so clearly about Michael as a kid was that he was always commentating. You know, I'd walk in to see him and he'd be commentating how he was about to give me a head high or a crash tackle. Dad had a liking for Coogee. He, he didn't want to move to the west where most of the community was, but seaside suburbs in the 70s weren't full of darker-skinned or uh, migrant families. Racism... I think it's obviously there, it's, you know, wog, you wog and all that type of stuff. I've put myself, I think, in situations, probably subconsciously, that have been difficult to be in from with my background so I could try and triumph in those and make, I suppose, my mum and dad, who probably got more racism against them than we did, right, uh, proud of how we're able to overcome that. We're playing in... Um... Waverley Oval. I played league at school, but I lived up the road from Coogee Oval, which is where Ramwick played, which was the rugby union club. It was a great era for us then, you know, a lot of famous players playing at Ramwick back then. And I was a bit of an outsider in that team, but I loved it. With 11 Wallabies in the Ramwick lineup, the Western Suburbs side were always going to be on the back foot. A beautifully worked move from Michael Checker, splitting them open for the first try. He's one of the players you love playing with. You know, he'd roll his sleeves up and he played tough. And he had a bit of cheekiness about him, which was good. It was to be an afternoon. Checker will long remember. He went in for four tries. Wasn't always appreciated for my skills. You know, I was a tough player. I, I like to play the game tough and hard. Is there any... I got distracted by the biff. <laughs> yeah, I liked a bit of that as well on the field. Don't worry about that. But uh, it goes with, it's part of the territory, a bit of beef in footy. I know it's now a bit um, PC, it's a bit not PC, but it's a contact sport. Michael was a, was a very fair player, but he, he was a very hard player. He, 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 he gave as good as he got and he copped plenty too. Last Saturday's Randwick East semi-final was in its concluding moments when the incident happened. I think it was early 90s. I went down in a tackle and I felt something land on the top of my head and I pull my head up and put my hand up to my head and literally my scalp, I'd been scalped, like it fell out into my hand. So someone had rucked me on the top of the head. I hope it's good television for you. Sew it up. Chica received 32 stitches in one of the worst head gashes seen in Sydney rugby in years. I'd been punished in the judiciary myself several times for, you know, the legal stuff on the field. And I thought, okay, well, this is a chance for me to see how the system works for me. And the system didn't work for me at all, and I was steaming. It was a lot of elements compiled. The rugby union not condemning the act at all. The judiciary, the judiciary scene, which was a real shambles. It wasn't even organised. It was like I was being cross-examined, if anything. It often felt for us uh, that there was sort of one rule for one group and a different rule for another, and that we, we were sort of somehow uh, watched over a little bit more or, you know, had a little bit of a, you know, reputation. There wasn't a lot of ethnic kids playing when me and my brother were playing. There was 
you know, it's not like it is today. So it was pretty easy to get branded for the, the way you played the game or who you were, whatever. And it's not easy to get rid of those tags, even 30 years later. I wanted to travel, so I played in France for three or four years and in Italy for a few years as well. I learned to speak a few languages and, yeah, I just came back different. Uh, so then I realised I didn't have any experience, like real experience. So went and looked in the job ads. I first met Michael when I placed an ad for a business manager. Um, I think it was back somewhere in the 90s, mid-90s, 1996, I think. And to be honest, it was probably the most senior serious role in my business next to myself. But I guess intuitively, I just thought he was the right person for the job. It was quite phenomenal that somebody who had such an imposing character with his cauliflower ears had um, a sensitivity to language and to the nuances of a fashion business. It looks beautiful though, it really does. The job was really to manage the business, the export growth. But in the end, Michael would then come to Paris with us. He was able to run the doors for us of our sh shows and collections because he could speak Lebanese, he could speak French, he could speak English, he had Italian. You know, he, he was the master of all languages and he would be the most unlikely person to be at the front door greeting the buyers from Barney's and Harvey Nichols and Harrods. He'll often play this thing of, oh, I'm just a dumb footy player, you know, oh, man, I'm, I'm just a dumb, but he's, he's sharp. And he, and he uses that, and I think people underestimate him. I think it made me a better footy player because I was able to have a totally different focus in life away from the game. So when I went back to the game and played, I just loved it. When I was working with Colette, I ran into a girl that I knew who was working for another Australian fashion designer, and we started just thinking, oh, do you want to start something of our own? Together they saw an opportunity in the market for distributing denim, but for kind of cult denim brands. I don't know why, but people were paying 400 bucks for a pair of jeans or 300 bucks for a pair of jeans, and it kicked off like crazy. And then they thought, well, if it works here, might it work on the international market? And sure enough, it did. He never did just one thing. <laughs> there was live fashion, there was a couple of property things he did, there was a little bit of uh, hospitality. He's always got a number of balls uh, in the air. Having that sort of stability, uh, that financial st stability, allowed him to make some of the moves he's made in his coaching career. So I was able to get into coaching because I wanted to, because I loved it. You know, I think if you start coaching to pay the mortgage, you're in trouble from the start because you, know, you make compromises that you don't want to make. Michael had his first great success as a professional coach in the biggest Irish province, Leinster. I was certainly not qualified for that position. That was a big team in Europe. Yes, they hadn't succeeded, but that was a very big team. And I felt grateful that they picked me and I wasn't going to let them down. His greatest successes have come when he's gone into underperforming but well-resourced teams, and he's been able to polish them up. I liked leading and helping people discover their potential, which is weird, because I would say I was a pretty selfish player. He took Leinster from Nowheresville to winning the European Championship. This is what Michael Checker can do. Some salad, Lulu? No. Crap, they don't need a lot. Not long after starting at Leinster, he met Stephanie. Yep. No. You're great. He's been moving around for so long. And I, and I always knew Michael wanted to settle and have a family eventually. What else, what else went on at school today? He was smooth, you know, smooth talker. And yeah, he was impressive straight away. And I'm a late starter to relationships, I suppose. So I would have been maybe 38 or 39 at the time. Yeah, she had to give up a lot, you know. Uh, like, I'm hard work, and when it comes to footy, I put everything into it, I live it. You know, she has to live the losses with me as well as the wins. You know, there's times where they've had a big loss or I would actually just take the kids out from nine till six or whatever I can do. He'd just be quiet on the couch, saying nothing for a day or two, and then he'll get over it, or well, as much as he can. Don't think he ever gets over it. <laughs>
After a horror season, the New South Wales Waratahs have a new coach promising a new style of rugby. This is a, a, a team and an organisation with a really big potential and, and I'd really like to tap into that. I got a call from the Waratahs looking for a new coach. I, I was petrified when I was coming back because, you know, I didn't know if my coaching at the top level would be effective there. The Waratahs were Michael Checker's um, sort of glory days. He took them to a title within two years of getting there in 2014. It's a try to the Waratahs! And he brought crowds back to the stadium. He re-engaged fans uh, and he made Australia's biggest provincial side perform for the first time in many, many years. A 19-year wait is over. Michael Checker has been appointed coach of the Wallabies two days out from the team's spring tour departure. I was actually been talking with Argentina about going there, but, you know, it's your national team, you can't say no. Like, I didn't even think about, am I ready, am I not? I was just going. Oh, we were ecstatic. We were ecstatic for his father's memory. We were just so thrilled for him, so thrilled to see a young man of Lebanese origin doing something great. Someone not tall, I need a sh someone shorter up top. <laughs> Michael Cech is a magnificent manager of men. He can take a team of disparate players and characters, galvanise them in a really short space of time. You've got to be tactical. You've got to have the ability to motivate and passion and be a leader. You've got to be able to recruit properly. And you've got to be able to, uh, to create uh, a story that players will follow to the end. He had a big focus on cohesion off the field and, and trying to create the kind of culture that could then go onto the field and, and play really special rugby. Within a year, the Wallabies were in the final of the 2015 World Cup. He took a, a broken team and he reminded them of their purpose and their ability and their passion, and um, he took them almost all the way. New Zealand claimed the World Cup title after seeing off a determined challenge from the Wallabies. The Wallabies are one of the iconic sporting teams in Australia. Historically, we've had a couple of golden cycles, but the expectation is that we have those golden periods all the time. You're dealing with a lot of factors you can't control. And I think often sports fans don't care about that stuff. All they want is the win. And if they don't get it, they want blood. Less than a year after reaching the World Cup final, the Wallabies have been brought back down to earth. From 2016 onwards, things got pretty tough. They lost a, a home series against England. And that is the, the final insult for the Australian team, a triumph for England. It's such a hard thing, coaching. And when you win, it's the team playing well. When you lose, it's the coach not doing their job. 2017, didn't get much better, and then 2018 was his worst in charge. As the Wallabies crumbled, the match followed an all-too-familiar script. He was frequently having cracks at referees. Um, they began to be seen as um, a bunch of whinges. Tech was someone who didn't feel like he had to pretend and, yeah, would say things that I think did come across as pretty antagonistic. There was one reaction to uh, the yellow card in which it appeared you swore and, and were accusing someone of being a cheat. Is it he at the moment? Do you apologise? No, okay. I never said. What, what are you talking no, about? But it's best to ask. Like, it's best to ask you, Michael. Is that really what we're going? No, is that really what we're coming? Is that what it's coming down to? It's going to be replayed on TV. It's best can that you play whatever they like. If that's if that's what yeah. it's come down to, that's it. Saw loser. Yeah, for sure. Like who doesn't? Who likes losing? Have I crossed, uh, crossed the line sometimes? Yes, for sure, right? I'm not, there's no way I'm going to say I haven't crossed the line. With the right intent? Yeah, maybe, I don't know. But then there's been many, many times where I haven't crossed the line, where I've kept um, silence, or there's been things I wanted to say, but I haven't. 
it's been a horrible year for Australian rugby. It's one punch too many, wasn't it, for Australia there? The Wallabies won just four games out of 13. On Monday, the Board of Rugby Australia will discuss a review into the Wallabies and its coach. At the end of 2018, a new CEO was in the role and she decided to appoint another level of management over Michael Checker. How do I feel about those changes? I didn't like them at all, you know? That showed to me they didn't trust me anymore. Uh, how did I react? I reacted in the wrong way by accepting it. Michael Checker had it all on a platter, but when the results weren't there and the losses piled up... We'll give it to nobody. The combative, at times disrespectful attitude just didn't wash. Another try to Argentina. It just look like a team at down on confidence, and, and that's definitely what they are. When success doesn't come and there's turmoil that starts to creep in, it's like an infection that just starts to build, and it's incredibly difficult to rid that. The 2019 World Cup was a calamity for the Wallabies. They were comprehensively beaten by England uh, in the quarterfinals. Uh, the better team won. That's, uh, that's the way it is, you know. You've got to suck that up sometimes. But uh, I was supposed to get this done for the people here, for Australians. I'm so disappointed. Michael Checker, are you considering your role as head coach of Australia? Mate, I'll, I'll be honest, it's a cruel, cruel world nowadays when you're asking those questions two minutes after the World Cups. We've been knocked out of the World Cup. And <clears throat> if you'd find it inside you to find a little bit of compassion for people who are hurting. As soon as the whistle blew in that game, I knew I was going to resign. It was obligatory, of course, like, hadn't done the job that was necessary to get done, you know? But I felt for him a lot, mate. He's given it everything he's, he's got, and he's, he's caged them hard. There was such a media furor at the time. It was harsh. The main criticism levelled at Michael Checker in the last two years of his time with the Wallabies was that they were one-dimensional, that brought under any kind of tactical pressure, they never had a tactical game plan that could respond to it. Just starting to panic with seven minutes left in the game. Just because media says something or infers something, it doesn't actually mean it's true, like, hello. <laughs> people see what they want to see, mate, right? So people will see oh, the, you know, too much passion, not enough tactical, and th that might be what they see off a couple of glimpses and they're not inside the, the world. So, you know, you can't achieve anything in the game unless you've got all of it. The biggest thing that I think was missed was just how much he cared for the team, how, how much he genuinely cared for the players, how much he wanted to be successful. It was a difficult period. It was a sad period. I'm oh, sorry. Um, it made me sad to see and hear those things about him. Knowing him as he is and how much he works and puts into a team, um, I don't feel it was really valid. Um, and it, it is upsetting. Yeah, it did upset me and I know it upset him. <laughs> when Michael Checker quit his position at the Wallabies, there's a certain section of people that thought he would just go away to lick his wounds. But anyone that expected that really doesn't know Michael Checker. I'm so eager to get involved in this project. You've got Japan reaching out to him, you've got Argentina reaching out to him. And then towards the end of 2020, Michael Checker was offered the role of coaching the Cedars, the Lebanese rugby league team. But it's going to mean a, a lot to a lot of people, whether they're close to you, family, or whether they're family over in Lebanon, whether they're just people in Lebanon looking to escape a bit of what's going on over there and just see the, the, the cedar tree on the field. To play for Lebanon, you need to at least have a grandparent uh, that was born in Lebanon to make you eligible. The national team for Lebanon is clearly going to come out of, of Sydney. The best players for Lebanon will come out of Sydney. We spoke last year about the cedar tree. It's symbolism, but symbolism's important. It's a massive tree and it creates a shadow. And footy is one, 
in the shadow. It's new for me. Obviously, I'm coaching in a different code completely uh, than what I'm used to, but I never went to a school that said, this is how you coach, right? So learning on the run was part of the deal. Czech's pretty good. He loves getting around it and sort of building this stuff up from the ground. You can see he's really passionate about it. So I think he knows what he's doing. And I think everyone sort of respects what he's done. Get up. Get into the shadow. I think his passion is his number one asset. He trusts us as players. He gives us confidence. Then, um, you know, as a coach like Dave, if you're getting confidence from a um, from a coach, you want to play for him. Ready? Oh, 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 oh. We've got five players that are playing regular NRL football. There's a bunch of probably another half dozen or so that are on the fringes in different clubs. There's guys who are young, still chasing their NRL dream. And there's some guys who, you know, that dream may have passed them, but they still love the game. They play each weekend and uh, the opportunity to represent Lebanon at a World Cup is, it's like Christmas Day, <laughs> you know. It, it's such a big deal for those guys, so. Go, 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 I think the beauty for every single player in, in that squad is that they will be better players um, for the period they've spent under Michael Checker. The Rugby League World Cup was supposed to be held in 2021, but because of the COVID pandemic, it was delayed to 2022. And in the meantime, Checker had become coach of the Pumas in Argentina. So right now, Czech works for NEC in the Japanese Rugby Union competition. He is obviously coaching the Lebanese Rugby League team based here in Australia, and he's the head coach for the Argentinian Rugby Union team. With the Cedars, the Lebanese team, it's something about heritage and, and where we're from, and I think the Argentinian guys really like that. You know, that's part of who they are as people as well. So they were very accommodating in, in giving me the time to do that. I've never seen that many plates spinning at once. It's just unbelievable. So he just moves from one job to another. It all sounds good and, you know, fun doing all these different things, but if you don't do them well, then there's no point in doing them at all. So, you know, you've got to make sure you try and get it right wherever you can. Heading into the Rugby League World Cup, the Cedars are not expected to do that well. Definitely one of the underdogs. And our squad's going to be um, not your traditional rugby league squad at a, at a World Cup, but I dare say our team will have more passion than any other team um, out on the field. For me personally, I'm going over there to win. I'm not going there for a holiday. Just want to win. There's nothing else in my mind. When we go there, we win. If we go in there with any other mindset, what's the point of going? When you do play for your national team, you've got to lift the level. You know, you've got to play above your weight. I suppose that's our advantage, the low expectations are from others, not from ourselves. He'll kill me if I don't say they can win. <laughs> um, look, I, I, think, I think, what can he do with them? I think he can get them to perform at their maximum. I think the, the hope for them is that they can jag a quarter-final, and from a quarter-final, uh, knock out footy, almost anything is possible. I'd never put a cap or a ceiling on what we can achieve. Uh, we've got New Zealand straight up. I'm just dreaming about the boys walking out beside the Kiwis, um, and then let's just see where this wave takes us. That 30 to 40 seconds after the game, where you see guys jumping around. Oh, the celebrations! They're the most rewarding moments where you can just sit back and say, I helped those guys achieve what they didn't think they could. And that is a very, very rare thing these days. It's all over. People are being told so much nowadays that they can't do things. Instead of seeing that all options are open. And congratulations to Michael Checker. And I think that um, footy's shown that for me because it's taken me to places that I never thought I could get to and I've realised that I actually can. Yes, I might be an outsider, but there's a reason I've stayed in the game and wanted to be a part of the game, because I want to belong in the game. I love it. Oh. Oh. 
Oh! <laughs> oh. 